Great. Um, I'd like to call the uh, Concord Light Board meeting to, uh, to begin. And today is uh, December 7th. Uh, <clears throat> we have a uh, upcoming meeting coming in a, in a week from now on December 14th. And then we have our usual scheduled meetings for the second uh, Wednesday of every month um, coming forward. And uh, Pam, I had seen we sent around some minutes. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you um, feel I, we're ready to, to move forward on any of those? Yeah, yeah. I just want to um, give us an update. So the 914 minutes are ready, and I really appreciate the comments. Um, the 1012 minutes I sent out, I know I didn't give you much turnaround time. Wendy and um, I think and Warren gave me comments. I have yet to hear from Alice and Brian. So I'm gonna hold those until our next meeting, but I do wanna get those out in the next meeting. So I'll wait for a few more days, Brian and, and, and Alice, uh, but I will then uh, send them in the form that I have them by the next few days for approval at the next meeting. We have nothing yet in for November. Um, so we're, we're, we're not too far behind, but we're, uh, we're, we're trying to keep up. And I do thank um, Karen for her efforts here. Um, the other thing I just wanted, since I have the floor, um, just uh, Wendy and I did have a little meeting, which was very productive with the town manager. At, as we had discussed uh, several months ago, the timing was difficult. Uh, to, as usual, things are difficult to schedule, but it was a good meeting. And I think that at some point we should give a very brief update on that, if you agree, Wendy. Um, yeah. And, and uh, so if you just put that on the calendar. And then the second thing related to that, and this goes to the minutes and the director's report, Brian, um, um, Carrie mentioned that you meet with her regularly. Um, and I think it's important to report that, I guess. Um, so again, if Wendy agrees, based on that conversation, I would say that reporting out on meetings that have content with the town manager would be useful. Um, so I just I just lob that out. Um, it's a it was it was an outcome from that meeting, but we can discuss it more when we get the meeting on the agenda. I, I don't meet with the town manager regularly. In fact, I've met with her once about a month ago and probably not for the last six months so uh, oh, okay well, then there's a little disconnect there the the impression yeah. i got was that there were in any event any meeting with the town man manager i would say probably it's a good idea to let it is a good idea to let us know to the extent that there's not confidential information exchanged yeah uh we didn't we didn't really talk about um board topics at that meeting either so um there was nothing i felt needed to be reported um but that's if if there ever is, I will. Yeah, and this isn't a. I'm not trying to. Yeah. Criticize you. Um, it was a comment, and so. Yeah. yeah, that's that's fine. Um, so um, I'm going to put on the agenda for for our next meeting for you to give that update about your meeting with Carrie. Is that sound okay? Yeah, when it should be Wendy and me. Wendy was very active in this meeting too. Okay. Yeah, and the, the context here was recall six months ago we had a conversation about reviewing the charter. <laughs> So that was that. So. The administrative code. Yeah, the administrative code. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay. Proper term. Um, well, talking about the admin code could end up being quite a big discussion. So I'll have to have to see what our, our yeah. comments are because I know we have a lot packed into that meeting already. Okay, I, so I, I, uh, let me just finish off that with saying I don't think it needs to be a content laden meeting. Yeah. I just think uh, it's important for us to let you know what what we what we heard and what we said. So don't, don't think you have to allocate half an hour to that report. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for a motion um, for the the September 14th uh, minutes. Who would like to make that motion? So, uh, Brian, I make a motion that we accept the September 14 minutes as distributed. Second. And we have a second from Warren. Great. Um, uh, I will approve. Uh, Wendy? Uh, approve. Uh, Pam? Yes. And Warren? Approve. Great. So we've approved the September 14th minutes, uh, and we'll continue to work on the October minutes. Um, hopefully we can close that out and vote on those at our next meeting, which is in a week. Um, 
Moving on, uh, we have a topic of the budget for 2023. Uh, Dave, uh, how, would you like to lead this or would you like to hand it over to Matt? So we're going to do a presentation. Matt's going to go through it and uh, we'll answer any questions as we come. Um, we got about an hour allotted for this. So um, we've been pretty good about staying on track there. So hopefully we can do the same here. Matt, you want to share your screen? Morning. Um, can everybody see a PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. So we are going to be going over the 2023 operating forecast for CMLP. Um, once the board uh, approves the, the the forecast, we will put a public version on our website. It will be redacted for some of the sensitive purchase power information. Um, and then uh, I wanted to explain in the years past, we've gone from the back of the forecast book to the front and this year we switched it. So we're gonna be going from the front back. Uh, the, this next slide, you'll see on the bottom left of each slide, there's a page reference that ties to the, uh, the, 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 the forecast book that you guys have, the, the board has. Thank you, Matt, that's helpful. I've got it, I've got the PDF open so I can jump around and look at the detail. Okay, and then we can actually send, I can send this PowerPoint out to whoever wants it as well. Um, okay, the first slide is uh, the net income. The gray bar shows the electric, the blue bar is telecom, and the orange bar is the co combination of, of the two. Uh, I don't know why in 2018 and 2019 it's red that these should be blue. I, I don't know, there's some glitch in, in Excel. So in 2022, we're projecting about a half million in net income for, the, for both companies, and then 2023, uh, I think around 2.3 million in net income. And we'll go through kind of the, what makes up that, that those amounts. This second slide is new this year. Uh, I, for the past couple of years, I've wanted to show you guys a cash flow projection. Um, there's a lot that goes into this. So there, I could have, there could be something that's kind of screwed up here, but I, I'm, it passes my smell test. Um, all of the other activity in the book kind of formulates what, what goes in, into this, into these numbers. So uh, <clears throat> we're projecting at the end of 2022, we're gonna have a, about 17.6 6 million in cash overall between both companies. And uh, in 2023, just under 17 million. Um, some of the key ones I wanna point out are the obviously the operating cash. In 2022, we are expecting to see about 2 million in there, and then it's going to drop down in 2023 back to about a little over half or a little over half a million. So, Matt, <clears throat> that's pretty concerning, actually, that the unrestricted cash would be that low. Um, we, to be honest, uh, most of 2021, that balance was negative, which is, I, I agree, not it is concerning, but. Um, Based on the fact that we have so much other cash, it's it kind of covers that up. I think it, it is concerning, but but I, I don't think it's a huge problem. Yeah, is is that a policy change where you have different buckets that are restricted now? Um, no. I mean, we we did the policy change like two years ago, but I mean, so I think the, the, wasn't didn't, the question was we had some guidelines on the ideals for what we want these balances to be, right? And the unrestricted cash was three months of operating expenses. Am I correct there, Matt? Yeah, two, two to three months. And so I, I think the 2 million is within that range and then yep. the, the 500,000 is a little bit low. So we should probably keep going and understand more about the overall budget before we jump on this. I mean, I understand cash flows, cash on hand, and we have a lot of restricted cash, but and, uh, we just, don't know uh, enough yet about the budget. So let's keep going. One more high level question before we move on. Um, the, the PCA that's in effect, uh, will that correct this before the end of the year? Or is this, this is after, this is projection after that the end of the year? So 
I think in 2022, the, the, the issue is, is addressed, meaning that we're going to have 2 million at the end of the year, 2023, we can talk about, but I, I, I'm not too concerned about if we're going from 2 million down to 500,000, I think that's just a little bit below our, what we would like to see, but 2 million is, is probably at the top of the range as far as two to three months of operating uh, on hand. So we'll, we'll continue on. And we'll, we'll, in, in keep in mind, we have just under 3 million sitting at E&E &E at, at any given time to pay for power expenses. So that's kind of the, you also have to kind of combine that in with, with uh, this balance. There you go. That makes me feel better. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the other two I wanted to point out, uh, depreciation fund and underground fund. We've been talking a lot about uh, starting to use these funds and draw these down because they are both very high. Uh, the reason you don't see a big drop here in 2023 is because the projects that were slated to use those funds don't really kick off until 2024. So in next year's forecast book, I would expect that these, these balances would be a lot lower than what you see here. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, moving on, uh, this was, this data was new a couple of years ago. It's the uh, so you guys have a look at the the salary and, and FTE data. The top mm -hmm. part of this is FTEs, and then the bottom is is total comp. And I, I have it broken up by kind of internal divisions. Um, <clears throat> the 2019 through 2022 data is actuals. With 2022 is a little bit of an estimate at the end of the year. And then uh, 2023 is as if we are fully staffed. Now, this includes a few positions that are currently unfilled, uh, which are two line, grade one line workers, one network engineer, which we're actually very close to filling. I think we're, we're kind of going through the final stretch of filling that position, <clears throat> as well as a new position that is yet to be developed, a new admin position. And can we speak, can we understand a little more about that admin position? Is this sort of someone that would help with some of these strategy projects? Dave, I know we've been advocating to make sure that you get the staff you might need to support all these strategy. Yeah, so so we, we carried uh, nine months of um, salary in here. We haven't established the position yet, but that is something we're working on. Uh, we need to go through that with the town manager as well. But um, that's... We, we wanted to carry it here, um, yep. planning for an additional uh, admin staff member. I, I'm fully in support of that. I just wanted to acknowledge that that's the nature of that position, if that was the intent. Yep. Thank Before you. Before you go further. Could you, could you elaborate? I'm sorry. Uh, Dave left. <laughs> sorry. So let's, let's go with uh, uh, Pam Hill first, and then we'll go to Warren. I would like to elaborate on that a little bit and say, I'd like to know a little bit more about what that kind of category is very broad. Um, and do you have any more pointed expectations with respect to the function of that position? Or is it too No, we're still working on it internally. Um, so you'll hear more about it as we go. We carry the number in anticipation for an additional member. Uh, we don't have all the details worked out yet, so I don't have a lot to share on that. But um, that's that's kind of where we are. I for for us to get through this, we we kind of need to get through the presentation, and and if we do a question on each slide, we're never going to get through the budget. Right, right. We do need to understand the assumptions, so we yeah. want our approval. So, yep. And and I will bring the stuff to the board. That that's the intent. When we're ready, which is we're in the design phase still. Thanks. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Warren, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask the vacant positions, are they in there? Not the new positions, the others, are they in there for the whole year or only part of the year in terms of that budget? We put them in there for the whole year. Yeah. But it, that doesn't seem, it doesn't seem realistic that you're going to have all those folks starting on day one, is it? Well, we have, we have applicants in the, um, in the system, so it's possible. Okay. Hey, um, excuse me, not to push this, but 
if you have applicants in the system, you have you must have a very pointed view of the function, right? I hope no. No, there's 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 vacant positions in the line worker area. We have two mm -hmm. openings, and we've yeah. been actively recruiting for that. So we budgeted for the full year in anticipation that we'd have someone come on. The network engineer, we're very close to having someone come on. Um, we're interviewing technicians for broadband. So we budgeted for the full year in anticipation of hiring. Oh, thanks, sorry. The new, the new position is nine months because there's development and recruitment process that we have to go through. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Matt, you could please go ahead. The, the, one other thing I wanted to point out here is we the town is currently in the middle of a class and compensation study with a consulting firm GovHR, and this we're not sure what the results are going to be, but there could be some pay raises, there could be some salary uh, range fun, uh, fluctuations. So th that's not really built into this, but just keep in mind that there that that could be coming down the, the road. This next slide shows the rate of return. The, the orange bar is the one I'd ask you to focus on. Uh, that shows the DPU calculated rate of return. This is what they would be judging us on. Uh, in 2021, we had 2.98% rate of return. In 22, we're projecting about a 0.24%. And then 2023 is 2.84, which is within that. The, Previously, the board had had set a, a target of two to three percent return, mm -hmm. and so that that is in that that twenty twenty three is within that that range. Great. <clears throat> this slide shows the sales volume, the kilowatt hours sold each year. Uh, twenty twenty or excuse me, twenty eighteen was a big year. We sold one hundred and seventy three million. Um, then moving into twenty twenty one, we we had a little bit kind of a cooler year, not as many weather degree days. So we sold 169 million. <clears throat> 2022, we're projecting 171 million, which is a pretty big year. However, I will point out that this, this includes uh, an average December and November volume. And so far in December, we're seeing it, you know, low degree days so far, it's been pretty warm. So that, that could uh, go down. And then 2023, per, we're projecting 166 million kilowatt sale, kilowatt hour sales. Um, <clears throat> going on the next few slides, I want to point out that there is a 5 million kilowatt hour difference between 22 and 23. There's a, a decrease, so that affects some of those number, the numbers, especially on the sales that you'll see on the next slide. So this uh, this slide shows the details of the revenues. The big one, the, the major one being obviously electric sales. In 2029, 2021, we sold 29 million. Uh, and then everybody knows what happened in going into 2022. The, the cost of power went way up. So we had to uh, add P a PCA on, a couple, a couple of PCAs on to um, capture, uh, to pay for the, all of that cost. So we were projecting to sell a little under 36 million in 22. And then in 23, we're looking at about 34 million. Now, I do want to point out part of that, part of the something that needs to be equated in with that is the provision for rate refund. This, this fluctuates each year with the uh, power supply, the cost of power. Um, we are planning to use some of the balance in that rate refund in 2023, which is allowing us to, re, to lower the rates than we would otherwise have put out, which Laura will go over after the, on the next topic of, of this meeting. Um, this Sorry. is just the, oh, go ahead. All right, quick question. So uh, your, your page numbers are not matching up uh, oh. with the slide deck. Um, oh, so the rate refund, I flipped. It's actually on page 30. But I, because I wanted it to be with the sales, I kind of flipped the section. So that there, there's a little, I just, for presentation purposes, there should be off one. Okay. I'm going to let, I'm just going to let you continue, um, but we'll, we'll, I'll follow along with the slide deck you're presenting. Okay. 
Uh, this is just a continuation of the prior page. I don't really have anything to discuss here. Just thought I'd put it out there. Moving on, uh, this is this is purchase power, and I think Laura is going to take over for a few slides. Thank you, Matt. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so the uh, I think many of you are familiar with this chart. There are a few different things going on with it. It represents um, our best estimate of the total electricity use in the town of Concord and consists of the sum of three quantities, one being the amount of power we import from the grid into town, the second being the amount of solar that we purchase through PPAs from on-system solar facilities, uh, which is green, and the amount of behind the meter solar, uh, which is an estimate of what we think is being generated on uh, individual homeowner and commercial establishment rooftop arrays. It's just an estimate, you know, it's not a number we can go check, um, but it's important to represent that to get a picture of um, how much is being used. The purple line is what's representing the weather. And the bigger that number, so like a, a spike in 2018 um, that's displayed on the secondary axis was a year we had 6,402 degree days, means there were lots of hot weather and or lots of cold weather. And you can see that usage is higher during those years than in more mild years, say uh, 2020 or 2021, when we had closer to 5,700 uh, degree days. 2022 so far, and again, 2022 is an estimate, it's not a complete year, um, looks like it's gonna be a larger than normal year, primarily due to the hot weather we had in July and August. Um, but when this estimate was prepared, we were, figuring normal weather for December. And as Matt stated earlier, it's looking a bit warmer right now. And so this number could go down a little bit, but I do think it's gonna be from a sales perspective, you know, a, a bigger year, which is still good for us because we still collect some of our overhead through the volumetric rate. And so the more units that we sell, the more return we get on our fixed assets. For 2023, we always forecast normal weather, which is about 6,088 degree days. And that would suggest um, purchases, excuse me, total use in the town of about 177.9 uh, million kilowatt hours. Um, you can see that the behind the meter solar um, has been growing over time. The red slab is is bigger than bigger part of the total than it than it used to be. So, and, and how are you making that estimate without production data? So what we do, Brian, is we utilize the actual seen capacity factor at the PPA solar arrays. And, a, and, and we apply that against the known installations that we have that grow every month. And that churns out <clears throat> a kilowatt hour production estimate. Okay. You got, if you have a better idea of how to do it, I'm all ears. Yeah, uh, it's not it's not appropriate for, for this presentation to kind of dig into that, but um, it, yeah, I think I, I might have some ideas on that. Okay, I like it. <laughs> um, okay, this is uh, what we have been spending over the last several years by cost category. And what we mean by that is how much is spent on energy, how much is spent on capacity, transmission, fixed costs, and renewable energy certificates. And you can see the big increase in total cost um, between 2021 and 2022. And the lion's share of that increase uh, is due to the energy costs rising from 7.9 million in 2021 to 12.8 million estimated in 2022. Thank goodness that capacity costs have actually been decreasing somewhat. Um, otherwise that would have made our total energy expenditure even higher if we were still paying 5.4 million a year in the the pink capacity and not 3.3. You can see, um, as we, we have told you in the past, that transmission just you know carries on with a slow, steady increase um, every single year. Uh, the fixed costs um, largely stay unchanged around 600,000 to a million. And our REC uh, expenditures you know, started in 2018 with a partial year. And then we're funded at a roughly a penny 
um, a cent per kilowatt hour basis for 2019 and 2020. And then we increased the collections in 2021 to enable us to buy more energy from non-carbon emitting resources. And we've kept that collection expense about the same. So we're anticipating collecting about, uh, spending about the same on RECs um, for 2022 and 2023. 2022 is a little bit higher only because if you recall, the board set up a mechanism whereby we spend on RECs what we collect. So if we sell more kilowatt hours, then we collect more money so we can spend more money. So when we go back to a return to, to selling fewer kilowatt hours, as we expect in 2023, we would, the allowance would be roughly 3.3 instead of 3.5 million. Great. Um, uh, one question. So fixed, what is, what is that fixed category? Is so it, it was, uh, the capacity contract? Um, there are, no, that's not the capacity contract that's in capacity. Um, in fixed, we have, um, there's the Watson, some Watson fixed costs. And, uh, well, we, we have the Watson contract to get the capacity value, the, the peaker plant value. Yeah. Um, Matt, can you bring that page up that'll show me um, exactly which categories aren't fixed? It's in the budget somewhere. Yeah, that might, is that, uh, that's on a page that's got sensitive information. I don't know if. Oh, okay. So, Brian, can we go over that with you maybe a little bit later? Um, that okay. we're, we're gonna we're gonna need to when we talk so, about rates. So, in in that category, is um is the rise contract, the Watson contract, uh, um, and that's the O and M payments for Watson, uh, and some E and E administrative fees. That's primarily what's included in that point seven. But but all, all of those expenses are uh, all of those contracts are related to power supply and they're all related to um, uh, meeting capacity and then the E and E obligation of administering all of this. Correct. Okay. It's a very good explanation in the narrative for the budget here, so people should look at that. If you've got yeah, questions. I just don't have that at my fingertips, Brian, and I'm a little discombobulated without my actual computer. So that's okay. That's okay. I. I we can we can move on. Thank you. Oh, so this is just the same chart. It shows it as a percentage uh, instead of raw dollars. Um, we actually started with this one because this is the one we typically put in the budget, but I found it confusing um, because it looks like Matt, do you have something to say? Well, this is the sort the oh by resource type. By resource type. <laughs> okay, we, we took it out. Never mind. Scratch that. Let's just start over again. All right. This is the percentages we spend for power supply by resource type. We have market based, um, which are uh, not resource specific, but are just purchased from the market. And the, the fuel ends up being whatever unit is on the margin um, in the grid at the time. And you can see those purchases have decreased from almost 75% in 2018 to an expected 40% in 2023. Um, hydro has increased from 7% to 18. Landfill stayed steady at 2 to 3%. Wind has increased from 8% to 13. And nuclear in particular, you know, has been making up a larger portion of the portfolio, um, starting it with purchases in 2020, and is now about 20% of the portfolio. And, and that 20% will plateau? No. Soon, or is that uh, you, your next slide is going to answer my question? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, this is a chart that is now available on the um, website under the power supply section in on CMLP's uh, webpage that was actually requested um, by one of the select board members. It's a little confusing, I apologize, but it has a lot of information in it. Mm -hmm. And basically, we're looking um, not by resource type anymore, but by how many renewable energy certificates we actually retire. Okay, and so now instead of seeing, you know, hydro and wind, you're seeing mass class one, main class two, um, nuclear, which are effects, emissions-free energy certificates, NIPA, which doesn't, it has Vermont tier one certificates. Um, the solar does not come with certificates. That's just the solar we buy on system. They wanted to see that separately, but I don't count it in the total rec uh, retirement contribution. That's why um, this blue 
uh, dotted box, which is sort of to the right of each of the data points, shows the percent of non-associated Massachusetts class one recs that we purchase every year and retire. And you can see that bar starts at the end of the orange, which is the last certificate we retire. So for example, for 2022, we had the 12, 7, 20, and 4% um, retirements. That's 19, 23, 43, um, plus 52 would be 95. So you see the top of that goes to 95. Um, so I don't count the solar in there. So um, to answer your question, Brian, um, it's easy to see in this chart because the nuclear does have its own type of certificates. And so you can see um, what percent of the portfolio we're anticipating it to become in the future years as additional tranches of nuclear contracts um, come online. So it's gonna to grow to um, a maximum of about 36%. Great, thank you. And, and I, I like the change to show the certificates versus the, the generation source. Uh, Pim? Just quickly, uh, Laura, why does um, nuclear drop does nuclear drop it from 29 to 30? Yes, there's a big contract that comes off at the end of 29. And what do we, is that mean a continuing diminution of nuclear as a resource for us? Or what does that mean? That is for you to decide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Future time. Yeah. Right, that's, kind of, that's kind of what I expected you to say. <laughs> I just sort of teeing it up again, because I think it's a really important question. That's yes. Awesome. Uh, in our, our previous meeting, we talked about potential new contracts. They started around that time uh, for nuclear. We just passed up a, um, an opportunity that came by for nuclear uh, power contract because the board wanted to deliberate further on it before making further commitments. Well, Avi, I think, I mean, this is, I'm just going to be a broken record on this. I mean, we it's a conversation that the town's interested in and their major policy implications and I think we need to get it on the agenda. There's a, there's a lot that we need to get on the agenda. We need to do more meetings. Well, whatever, we need to prioritize. Yeah. Too, I guess. Yeah. Well, okay, um, you can continue, Laura. Yeah, you I just, the only other thing I wanna point out about this, um, I apologize for that background noise. Somebody's not happy. Uh, the only other thing I wanna point about out about this is if you see in 2023, our, um, purchases that come with associated RECs have grown significantly. They're up over 50% now. At the current funding of the uh, renewable energy um, rate, we this year would actually retire more than 100% of our sales in certificates, which you would never want to do. So this 2023 won't ever happen. So we, if by the end of the 2023, the bar won't look like this. We will either um, uh, decrease the surcharge in the in the rate, or we can um, keep the money in the fund and use it for a future year if prices should go up. You know, there are a number of different uh, ways to address this, but we would never want to retire more than 100% of our sales. Right. Well, that, it's funny because that was the question I wanted to ask, but wasn't going to to save time. Okay, uh, sorry. But, but no, that uh, that is, uh, I believe, if and it's just my memory, but I think we talked when we talked about policies, we talked about um, holding a certain amount in reserve before we start decreasing the the rate of collection, um, and I believe it was five hundred thousand or something in reserve. I don't um, think and, there's a written policy about that anywhere, Brian. And I think it, you know, if I the board wants be. one, we should we should have one. Yeah. Uh, Wendy. Just a comment. Remember that the nature of the rec fund allows us to use those funds for purchasing green energy as well. So it doesn't well, have to well, be that's, a that's what we're that's what we're doing. Um, we could we could put that towards an in in town solar project is I think what you're you're saying Wendy I'm just saying the nature of the, the fund itself is defined so the funds could be used for the purchase of green energy separate apart from Rex that's all I'm saying we can keep going that's just a point okay um, uh, Laura do you have another slide Matt or do I have another slide 
Nope, no. that, that's the end. Th thank you, Laura. Uh, moving on to the O and M cost. Uh, this this slide shows kind of a breakdown by each each category. Obviously, the yellow is which is the administrative and general costs are the big driver to to this section. So we'll see the details here. <clears throat> so here are the details behind those that slide. Uh, the one the one item I wanted to point out on this page is, is that we're going to be picking up a tree trimming a third of the town in 2023. That's part of our cycle, four year cycle. Uh, moving on to the next page, uh, we're going to talk about the energy management budget in just a second in two slides. But here I want to just point out the costs have risen dramatically uh, from 21 to 22. And then the the big items here that you know are always the driver are the uh, administrative general salaries. Those are, are going we're projecting quite a quite an increase. Um, this includes the that position that we talked about earlier, the undefined position. So that that's part of that that increase. And then the other one I want to point out is the pension and OPEB. If you remember during the audit discussion for 21, there was a steep decline in the cost for the pension and OPEB, which was based on a change in the actual, some actuarial assumptions, as well as our, our plan assets, uh, plan investments did better than what were expected. So that drove our cost down. What I have in here, the, the numbers for 22 and 23 are based on what, what our contributions to the plan plans are they could this could fluctuate based on the the actual reports when they come out but this is my best guess at this point of what we're going to be spending moving on uh the energy management forecast uh i changed this up a little bit this year the uh, the first column which is the 22 forecast is what was in last year's forecast book what we, what we planned for. The second column is what we've spent to date at, at 10, 20, at 10, 7, 22. And then based on the, that activity year to date, we're projecting we're going to spend what is in the third column. And then I added a, a budget to actual amount, which compares the 22 projection to the 22 forecast. And then lastly, the, the, the fifth column is what we're expecting to spend uh, in 2023. So I'm going to point out some key, yeah. key areas, and then we can. Uh, you, I'm sure there'll be questions. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, in 22, we went over our forecast for home energy assessments by about 20,000. The air source heat pumps went way over. This is this is the this includes the uh, $10,000 whole home air source heat pump rebate, which which matches the Mass Save program. That we put into place last year, and we went over we went over our forecast by uh, four hundred some thousand. We did not have any ground source heat pumps, heat pump rebates in twenty two. Uh, we went a little bit over on the solar, what we expected for solar programs last year or the current in the current year, and then we did not have any uptake with commercial heat pumps in twenty two. And then I'm just going to go over some, some items in 23, and then we can stop for questions. Uh, we're planning on uh, 48,000 for home energy assessments in 23, 540,000 for air source heat pumps, uh, 86,000 for heat pump promotion, which is part of the part of what drives that increase in the in the hair, in the heat pump area. Uh, almost 100,000 in solar rebates. And then between all of these EV programs, we're playing, we're expecting about 111,000 next year. And then lastly, the high efficiency lighting program for commercial is 57,000. So any questions on that? So a, a lot of these depend on, you know, advocacy efforts, state matching incentives, other programs going on. So these are very hard to forecast. But I, I want to ask the question: um, 
as a category, are we year over year ballparking this correctly? Maybe, maybe there's more heat pump rebates than solar rebates this year, but you know, 2013, there was far more solar rebates than heat pumps. Um, for, this, for this category, are we, are we forecasting the total uh, relatively correct? Or are we over or under every year? So think, go ahead, Matt. Prior to prior to 22, we were pretty close. I, I think we went over a, a, a bit in 21, but I think in prior to that, we had we had done pretty well this year with the, the heat, the air source heat pumps that just went way over what we expected for, for the whole category. Yeah. Uh, Dave, did you want to add more to that? Yeah, I'm, you know, I think Matt, Matt hit it right. The, the heat pumps have been very successful, uh, much, much higher level than we anticipated. Um, and, you know, we're seeing them come through weekly. So we don't anticipate that declining. And that's why we forecasted it the way we did, um, which is a good thing. That's what yeah. we're looking for, right? Um, I think in this area, you know, a couple of questions that I would have would be, you know, well, how much is this cost in the ratepayers? How are we funding this? And uh, essentially, if you take the average uh, customer, average residential customer is contributing about five dollars uh, in the rate towards this per month. So about sixty dollars a year for the average customer. Right, but I, I know from like the EV programs that we did the analysis to see that if we got people to charge off peak, that uh, all of the efforts for the uh, the incentives and the education efforts were covered by the, the savings you would see from off-peak charging versus on-peak. Um, have, have we done that analysis with the other programs as well to have them where someone adds a, a, a product or a, a device, is our efforts actually going to be net positive for all rate payers by uh, lowering rates for each of these categories. We, we've done it for a lot of them. I don't know if we've done it for all of them at this point. Okay. Well, all right. Um, uh, Warren, uh, you have a question. Yeah. Are these numbers for heat pump installations and EV um, rebates factored into the projections for electricity use in the coming year? Yes, I see, I see Laura and Matt and Dave all nodding okay. along. Yes, it is. Um, do you have another question, Warren, or is that it? No. Okay, uh, Pam. Uh, quickly, and I think this, you're just gonna say it's another category, another issue, but how are we factoring in, um, thinking about or strategizing for battery storage, solar saturation, that whole end of things? Um, is that something that's a separate discussion that's just not joined yet in, in what we're doing? Or do you have work being done that could be quantified to show uh, how we're developing our thinking on those things? Steve? Yeah, I, just, I didn't want to <laughs> step on someone. Um, no, we are working on that. Um, I think in reality, you're probably talking about 24 budget for battery storage. And um, that's that's factored in here, but we we're working on it. But it's all all that cost is just labor right now internally, and that would be in the A and G section, the administrative salary section. Now, uh, to to clarify, Pam, are you asking about um, incentivizing homeowners and businesses to put in energy storage, or are you talking about the utility putting in energy storage? thing sort of macro the utility and the general question which i think is a is, is pretty significant about how we are going to start um realizing battery storage as an element of our thinking and our cost that's uh, yeah. it's, it's more it's, in this it's not individuals i would i would put energy storage is still in early stages of development in our process uh wendy I, I, like just, I mean, well, if you look well, at Brian, the Brian, I'll just say one thing, Brian, yeah. just, just a point of procedural point. I'm really interested in the responses from Dave and, and others uh, on the in the light plant on these questions. Thank you. 
Well, Pam, we're talking about the, the, the funding for uh, residential and commercial rebate programs. We're not talking about the utilities energy storage process, which is a different category, as Dave explained. I'm just saying we don't, I'm okay, never mind. Um, we're going to talk more about it, Pam, as we get into this budget. Thank you. Uh, Wendy. Uh, so I just had the same comment. There's some information about those projections in the budget, so I'm sure we should proceed and that will cover it. Uh, Matt, a... right. um, guess what's next? Plant. So uh, th this this slide shows the uh, net change in plant value. Obviously, in 23, you see a big jump, which is the green, which is our, our plant additions. The orange is what we're expecting for plant retirements. Uh, so I'll move on. The next piece is the five-year capital plan. So I'm going to go through and highlight a bunch of stuff on these next couple slides. <clears throat> So the only one on this slide is the trans station equipment. This is uh, 500,000 for relay upgrades that would be required for us to become a set settlement only generator, the SOG that we've been talking about, okay. meaning we could send monies, or I should keep saying monies, send energy back to Eversource across the, uh, at our main station. Great. And there's more costs of this down on the next page. We'll go ahead. Wait, can I ask a question about that? That yeah. was a short-term strategy, which would offset that need for battery, but right? Yep. Yes. <laughs> okay. Warren. Uh, how come a, the number is showing up in three years for purchase of that equipment? Um, it's not just one, you know, it's not, we're not just buying one piece of equipment. It's a number of things. And then there's also, we're also factoring in, um, Lead times on a lot of this equipment is years or a year to two years out some, in some cases. Plus we have to schedule our work accordingly. We can only do so much with the, the, the manpower that we have. But does that imply that we actually won't be able to send power back to out of town until after 2025? That's, that's what we have forecasted right now, Warren. Um, I think to elaborate on what Matt said is, you have some design costs and that would be first. And that's gonna take some time for consultants to do some design work for us. Then you have uh, purchasing of uh, equipment, uh, which has lead times and then installation. And that's why it's spread over the three years. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> this next one is uh, solar generation, which is a new FERC account this year. We have a, uh, 5.65 million for the middle school solar project. <clears throat> there is potential for about, we, the town has ARPA funding that, that could cover this up to 500,000. And then we also have a potential for Inflation Reduction Act monies, which could fund up to 30%. It's not, that's not a given, but just wanted to let you, let you know that there, there are funding sources out there. Uh, the next piece is distribution station equipment. This includes the another million for that SOG relay upgrades that we just talked about. And then another 1.5 million for SCADA equipment, which is a project we've been planning on doing for a while. That gives us, our engineers, the ability to control, see and control things at the main, at the substations uh, from their desks. <clears throat> the next piece is the energy storage equipment. We've got $4 million here, which would be for a, ba a town battery. This would be, at this price point, it'd be a very small battery, probably not big enough for what we need, but we just wanted to have something in here. Um, <clears throat> and I, I want to point out that we do have the ability to, on both the solar and the battery, we have options as far as we don't have to purchase them outright ourselves and take on debt. We can... Um, go with a lease or PPA. So there's a lot of discussion that need, that need to happen uh, with you guys on, on these decisions. Uh, the next piece is underground conductors. This is what we've been talking about for a while. We have some conduit already in the ground at a few locations. We need to, we're gonna go and fill those with wire and then energize them. And then we will take down the overhead infrastructure where, where available. Uh, that includes um, 
what is it, 2 million for that. Uh, transformers, we're seeing uh, lead times and prices for transformers. Uh, they're, they're, they're long lead times and the prices are, are getting crazy. So we're, we're going to start ordering transformers to see if we can get them in stock so we don't run into the situation where we're caught without any equipment that we need. And just, just to expand on that, we have inventory in stock right now for our needs. But with the lead times being as long as they are, we're worried if we don't start replenishing now, we'll we'll run into issues. And so that's what we're budgeting for. These next two are meters and load control devices. This is part of the AMS meter project that we've been doing with for, with, for a while. We've been meeting with the, the vendor and we kind of have a timeline now. Some of the infrastructure will start arriving early in 2023. Uh, our first residential meters are expected sometime in April or May of 23. And then uh, commercial meters should be coming later towards the end of 2023. Transportation equipment, we have a lot going on here. Uh, we already have on order a hybrid bucket truck, which is a replacement for the what we currently have. Um, we have a hybrid truck for the line crew leader uh, that's already on order. And then we have, we're planning to also replace a passenger vehicle with an EV in 23. Into 2024, we're planning on three more EVs with re replacing current passenger vehicles. And then in 2025, we're planning to replace a Digger Derrick truck, which is the more expensive of the two truck types that we have. And then the last item, this is the uh, a level three charging station that we're going to be putting in at the ride out playground parking lot in West Concord. Uh, there is, I believe that there's about a hundred thousand in grant funding possible for this project. Yeah, we have a hundred thousand that we've been awarded. So that'll offset the 140 and, and leave about 40. Excellent. Um, I'm glad to hear that update because last update we received um, it was unsure if the paperwork was submitted on time. And if it was awarded, then everything worked out. Contra contracts have been signed by the state, so we're we're heading down the right path now. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Okay, this is the debt service. Now this is looks a little bit different than prior years. This shaded section down here uh, down here on the bottom left. That is our existing debt. Most of that will come off in 26 and 27. This purple section is what we're expecting for the, uh, the AMS meter project, the, the, the debt that we've already been approved with that town meeting. The green section represents the middle school solar. And that's, that's with us only receiving the 500,000 ARPA funding that otherwise it, it's, being fully funded by debt. So this there's this isn't set in stone by any means. We also don't have the approval for this, this uh, borrowing yet. Same thing with the, the yellow portion up here. This is the, the battery. Now you'll notice that there's only two mil, I only have two million here. That's because we're planning on uh, two million of it also being funded out of cash, a depreciation funding. Uh, I have a question as well, but Wendy, uh, go ahead. I just want to ask Matt, so the, the projection here for the middle school is without ARPA funding? It is with the five half million ARPA funding, but it is not, oh. it does not include the 30% Inflation Reduction Act monies, which would okay. cover 30, per, we believe 30% of the project. Okay. It's a topic for a future meeting, just trying to get a handle on that potential debt, because we need to start thinking about it, right? Yeah. Town meeting potential. Right, we have a, an, uh, this isn't a budget topic, but we do have yeah. a deadline of the 16th, I believe, to talk about any articles. Um, but I, I, with the middle school solar, that is just solar, that's not solar and storage on that site. I know that site was designed with storage, uh, oh. but that 5 million estimate is just solar. Correct. Right. Correct. The The site is going to be, it's designed for storage uh, with the intent of putting storage, but that's not funded at this point because we have to figure out 
if we're going to own it, if we're going to do a PPA or a lease. And that's something that uh, we need to get some numbers around and talk to the board about. And the Main Street uh, Station battery, um, I, I don't believe I've heard much about this. Uh, uh, is this the, the site that you feel you would put utility scale storage mm -hmm. at? Is no, I think there's a several locations that this could go. Uh, we just, I just put main station just so that we knew it was a town battery and not the middle school battery. Okay. But, all right. So, just a, uh, just a quick question. Um, Dave, you said that this was not battery, but I just want to point out in the, um, in the actual schedule of funding, it says it's middle school solar plus battery for 10 million. Okay. Yeah, the, the battery the battery is separate from what we're showing okay. here. And so we okay. probably need to clean that up a little bit. Because it looks like it's 750 each year. 20, I don't know, 25 and beyond. Okay. And, and 2 million is not going to go very far with a, a battery <laughs> system. So no. I, I, that is a low, extremely low estimate. For, for any kind of utility scale storage project that we so would do. Brian, Matt just said that that was, that in addition to that 2 million, there would be 2 million funded out of depreciation. So that's 4 million. And that Correct. was acknowledged up front that this was not a five megawatt battery. This was a smaller battery. So it's a $4 million price tag, not two. Okay. All right. We just wanted to have something for you guys to kind of visualize as, you know, the, to start, we're gonna to need to start thinking about how we're gonna fund all these projects coming up. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is this is good planning. All right. And I just want to add in that these are all 10 year terms with 5% interest. Um, that's what I'm, I'm seeing. Um, we can change the terms, but 5% interest is what I've been seeing as far as all the recent issues, bond issues. Okay. Moving on to uh, telecom. This, uh, this shows the net income of telecom. The green bar is revenues versus the yellow bar and which is expense, and then the orange line is the net income. <clears throat> We're projecting a little over three hundred thousand in in revenue or in net income for twenty twenty three. Uh, this slide shows our telecom revenues year over year. The blue is residential, and uh, orange orange is commercial. You'll see we have pretty steady growth in residential and then we saw a pretty good uptick in 22 for commercial so hoping that continues <clears throat> the here is the detail behind that that prior slide the residential for 2023 represents a 7.5 percent increase and commercial a 9.7 increase um, we are, we did attribute a little bit of extra revenue here based on the rate changes that were just approved, I believe, at the last board meeting. So we're expecting a little bit more revenue, not a ton. Um, this is the O&M cost for telecom. The, again, just like electric, the yellow portion is the driver, which is administrative general cost. We'll see here. Uh, here's the details behind that. Uh, bandwidth, we're expecting a little bit of an increase in the bandwidth cost. This is also related mm -hmm. to the rate increase. We had to approach our vendors to ask for more, more uh, speed, I think it was. So one of the vendors is, is uh, increasing our cost a bit. Moving on. The big, the big item here is the uh, administrative and general salaries, which is what about a forty thousand dollar increase? Um, this is mainly just due to um, raises going in the current year, <clears throat> and then the five year capital plan for telecom. There's only a couple items here: uh, transportation equipment. We're expecting to purchase a new splice truck in 2023, and then um, another one in 27. And then uh, communication equipment, we have some uh, infrastructure equipment and station equipment that we need to purchase in the upcoming years. And then we're almost at the end, telecom debt service. 
this slide is just like it was last year. No, no difference because we, we haven't added any debt uh, since then. But in the past, you guys have asked for whether this has the 1.9 million telecom loan in it. So I made a new chart that includes that. So <clears throat> the right. orange, gray, and yellow are the existing debt that we have, the, the actual bonded debt. And then the blue over here represents the telecom $1.9 million loan uh, payments on top of uh, late, overlaid with that. Um, I think certainly through 25, 2025 and probably 2027, these payments are, are within the, the realm of possibility. Once we get out here into 28 and beyond, we might need to adjust these payments depending on how much growth we have. And so we'll have to play that by ear. I think so. Any questions on telecom? No, um, uh, thank you for this slide. Uh, I know some people will ask about it um, and thank you for the explanation that it's adjustable um, should opportunities for telecom come up and the debt load is preventing them from moving forward. Uh, we can at least ease that and allow them to capitalize on good opportunities. Anything else? That, that is the end of my slide show. Okay. So we are about 12 minutes behind. Um, so I would like to transition to our next topic, which is to suspend the regular meeting and open up a, a rate hearing. Um, so I'm, I always get these motions incorrect. So uh, if someone would like to, to do it for me or correct me, um, I, I would like to suspend the regular meeting um, and do a roll call vote to open up uh, a rate hearing. Uh, so, so Brian, could you ask someone on the board to do a motion and then okay. second? Great. Um, Wendy, would you do a motion for yeah. me? <laughs> yeah. I make a motion that we suspend the regular meeting and open a rate hearing um, for the proposed 2023 rates. Second. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Warren. Yes. Uh, Pam. Yes. Wendy. Yes. And myself, I agree. So uh, now we have a rate hearing and Dave, uh, would you like to lead this? Yeah, I'll start it and then uh, Laura will kind of go through the stuff. Um, we, in your packet, we sent um, the proposed 2023 rates. There's no um, proposed real rate design change. It's more to reflect cost, and um, we're going to go through that. But um, I'll let Laura take over. Laura, do you do you need me to uh, share the slides? You're muted. Can you share the chart, Dave? Yeah. Yes. I know you received a lot of pages of redlined and changes accepted documents and. Unless you guys want to, we may or may not go through each one individually, but fortunately a picture says a thousand words. And when Dave puts this chart up, I think it's gonna be easy to understand what's going on with rates. Okay, so the way to read this is going across the x-axis. Those are our individual rate types. So you have R1 and T1 means the tier one rate. The residential rate assistance is to the right of that. The time of use on peak, time of use off. R7 is that heat pump heating rate, um, the ETS rate, the small general service, medium and large. Um, and so the blue is what uh, customers were paying when we started 2022. Um, so the R1 tier one rate was you know, about 16.3 cents, I think, um, when we started the year. Once we added that big PCA with July bills, that rate shot up to like 22.2 cents or something. So the orange is that incremental element we added to account for the sharply higher power supply costs. The black dot is what we what has been proposed to you in the rate sheets for that rate class. So you can see the black dot in all of these um, customer classes is above the blue, except for the residential rate assistance, which means the rate would be higher than what we started January 2022 with, 
but the rate would be considerably lower than what people have been paying the last five or six months, because that's where the orange bar is at the top. So this kind of explains it to me a lot about, you know, sort of relatively where the 2023 rates are. And as Dave said, it's really a function of, um, of the cost increases. We haven't changed any methodologies. If you remember, we hired an outside consultant to come in and do what they call a cost of service study, which allocates CMLP's costs to these different customer classes, depending on their or according to their load pattern how much they um, are of the peak, how much they are of the energy, how much they are of how many customers we have and how complicated it is to generate their bills. Um, so they came up with that methodology. And you may also recall that it was discovered or um, analyzed by the consultant that there was some discrepancies among the rate classes as to who was paying their full cost of service and who was not. And the board elected to maintain those differences. And so we haven't changed the methodology here. The same differences are being applied. It's just that the 2023 total revenue requirement has been allocated according to those same percentages. And this is what results for each rate class. Great. Uh, do you have more to add? No, unless you want to go through each rate schedule, which I don't know if that's required for the rate hearing. Is it, Dave? No. We can pull them up if, if um, the board wants. Yeah, so I had um, I had emailed the board and this will be in the minutes, my email will be in the minutes, um, my thoughts on changes to the proposed rates. And in particular, do you mind leaving that up? Uh, nope. Dave? So in particular, I had, I had different changes, but the one that I, I want to talk about is ETS. The ETS rate um, has been subsidized and the cost of serv service studies have shown it's subsidized. And right now they are paying close to what would be the off-peak rate um, for electricity. So they're, they're dramatically lower than the off-peak rate in the time of use uh, structure. So I, I would like to propose that we charge not the proposed one and a half cents, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, uh, for distribution, but charge the same distribution rate that the R1 is being charged, which is something like six cents. That will still keep them lower than the off-peak tour uh, cost. And, uh, and this is not a, a uh, income qualified rate. Uh, this is technology rate. And, uh, and we have an opportunity to correct this while they're currently paying about the same price. If we don't make this correction, you can see how that dot drops. And we will have to put them onto a year over year, you know, increased schedule like what was proposed in 2014. And it's, it, it just, it's not going to happen because it hasn't happened in the past. So I, I would really like to see them pay the full distribution price. So just for information, Brian, the black dot represents their, they're paying the energy cost and also a 17% increase in the distribution costs, which is the same increase that the residential customers um, experience for distribution. Correct. On a, on a percentage basis, that is correct. But yes. the the actual amount they're paying for distribution is is point zero zero one seven five. Yeah, like fractions, small fractions of a penny yeah. uh, for distribution, whereas the R one and every other rate is paying uh, six cents in total. So they're paying a dramatically lower amount for distribution. But, so a seventeen percent so increase is 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 a rounding error. Yes, and I, I agree with you, but this is a very complicated topic because they are paying the same energy rate that all the other rate classes are paying. And right. they do not get energy at the same times of day that other people do. So for example, when the R1 rate class is using energy at 5 to 7 p.m. during the peak, all the ATS units are off. And that's because CMLP controls them. So, right. you know, there, there are some issues on the other side that are not 
just strictly focused on the, what they're paying for distribution. And, and that's why they're not paying the penny of capacity that the off-peak rate is paying because they're controlled. But when they don't pay the six cents for distribution, the rest of rate payers need to fill in and, and that six cents goes higher for everyone else. So that's my frustration is that they're, they're not supporting the light plant operations. It's, it's, it's energy costs, almost energy costs only. And, and that isn't fair to the other rate payers. Uh, I, I, I see some hands, I've dominated the conversation. So uh, Wendy, uh, would you like to add a comment? Uh, I think you might be muted. Sorry. Um, yeah. So in terms of ETF, I just uh, this they do get a discount because of the control that CMLP has on those um, over their usage. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, Laura. I was trying to go back to the cost of service study. Isn't the ETF one of those rates where they were under the true cost of service? So. Is the rate that you're suggesting here now put them in line with the actual cost of service? And is there an opportunity to, to not do the black dot, but make sure that we are aligned with that cost? So um, you are correct that they are one of the rate classes that was under their cost of service. Yeah. But for this year, we elected not to make any changes to the allocation methodology, but merely to apply the same percentages to a higher cost of service. And so um, they're basically paying the same percentage of overall cost right. that they paid in 2022. Which was shown to be under collection. Well, it wasn't under as much as the R1 class was under, Brian. I guess I'm just, I guess my question was, is this an opportunity sort of in the vein that Brian was saying, but um, because they're paying such a high rate now, is there an opportunity to increase that rate, you know, break from your methodology, if you will, to make more progress toward getting them to be aligned with the true cost of service? Well, it's one reason, I'm not sure how. Yeah, one reason we didn't propose any major changes is because don't forget, we are on the cusp. I know we've been saying it for a I while. We're on the cusp of moving to an entirely new rate methodology, yeah. which is going to be time of use. And so, right. is it really worth the board's time right now? to go through a major reallotment and reconfiguration when it's really a very short-term thing. So, so I think I think that's fair. And this is actually one of those ETS rate topics that we had intended to get to over the last few months and have not. Um, the last few years. Well, We've, I mean, exclusively I, in anticipation of time of use. This was one of the four topics, I think, Laura, that you raised earlier. You know, maybe it was last January. But let me move on. So I understand your argument, Laura, and I, I appreciate that, you know, it could be a short term decision. But in terms of the other issue that we did talk about this last year was the fixed rate. And I did see that we only proposed a 5% increase in the fixed rate. And I, I, I did see Brian's comment, but I um, wonder if there is an opportunity this year to increase that fixed rate, not by 5%, but by a larger amount. Uh, respecting that if we did that, it needs to be offset by lower um, incremental or the variable cost. So just don't, I want to ask if that is an opportunity because we do need to make every opportunity we can to increase those fixed costs. And, and this would be the time to start making a little more progress. And, and that has been one of my frustrations with our changing of rates is we talk about we need more analysis we push it off. No. We then say mid-year that we need to do it at the end of the year when we review all rates, and then the cycle continues. This is this is been a process. And, but and Brian, I think we did talk about this. I think the board did give direction to say be more aggressive. We're not ready to jump to a, a larger jump, but we did express the frustration on the slow path and uh, some support for being more aggressive on it. Now, I'll also comment that on the, that rate discussion, I think Laura had raised a question. When we get to time of use, uh, there's also a demand charge thing, but that's another strategy question. I don't want to get there right now, but I, I do think it would be valuable to increase the fixed rate more than 5% if possible. Um, and of course, unfortunately, we're, we're only having this conversation now. So I don't know if that's still an option right now. So yes, I, I had suggested 
uh, in my email that we raise it 10%, not 5%, which would be $18.50 on the R1, the time of use, and the G1. Uh, and that would reduce the 17% increase of the variable collection. So really my, my frustration was uh, seeing the fixed collection percentage increase being lower than the variable collection. Uh, it should be the inverse. So, so the reason those percentages were, were chosen, Brian, is because when Baker Tilly, when we set out the strategy to increase the fixed rate, we set sort of a fixed, modest increase. It was like 5% a year. And we so, put that out into the future. And right. then everything else has to fall into place to meet the cost of service. But, you know, your board can make a decision. They want to deviate from that acceleration path and accelerate it faster. And and we expressed that in previous meetings. The, the Baker Tilly, it, we, we've discussed before and and talked about what our desires were. We didn't but I think a formal vote is needed on that in order for us to, to cement those changes. Uh, Laura, I'm gonna lie, do you, you wanna have a follow-up before I go to Warren or? No, just to say to Wendy that um, yes, it's possible um, to make changes at this point. Right, thank you. Uh, Warren. Yeah, I have two questions. One is on this issue of the fixed rate changes this is for Laura and Dave. Beyond the fact that there seemed like there would ha had been a prior decision to just do these small, modest changes to the fixed rate, now listening to this discussion and thinking about it, would you be comfortable with the higher fixed rate changes, or do you think there are specific reasons not to go in that direction? I think in the past there has been there have been some voices that were concerned um, that the a more accelerated increase in the fixed rate would burden the low volume electric users because there will be a cost shift. Yes, the variable rate goes down, but depending on how much you use, the increase in the fixed cost could be more or less than the decrease you experience in the variable rate. And so there will be a cost shift if we raise it more quickly from the larger users to the smaller users. And you know maybe the board's comfortable with that. It's just that in the past, there has been this that opposing viewpoint. And I haven't felt like I've gotten enough direction to for the board to, with unity, say, here's the acceleration rate we want to use. Yeah, I have, um, being new on the board, that's an issue. I'm not sure I have enough information to decide where to decide where I would come out on that question. But I also had a question related to the ETS rate and what Brian was proposing there. Um, again, being new on the board, I understand this argument that we should wait till we implement the time of use rates. But realistically, when do you envision we would actually be implementing time of use rates? 2024. At the beginning of the year? Um, that's difficult to say. I do think that it, it depends partly on the, the speed of the rollout of the installation of the residential meters, number one. And number two, um, whether we're willing to experiment and start off with rates that are later informed by actually seeing what the load patterns look like. Because you know, as you know, right now, the meters we have are dumb. I don't know when residential customers are using energy. And so when we roll out a time of use, we're going to make assumptions about how many hours people are going to be using energy on peak, how many are going to be off peak, and that may or may not be right. So if you want to take a very cautious approach and not start rolling out time of use until after we've had, say, six months or maybe even a year of actual load pattern data that we can examine to inform the rate design, you know, that's that's one thing. If you're willing to go with experimental rates and then adjust them as needed, I think um, the beginning of 2024 is is definitely possible as long as Dave tells me he can get them all installed by the end of the year. Yeah, so I would I would say on a conservative approach, it wouldn't be January of 24. It'd probably be end of first quarter when we'd be ready. Um, and that's assuming that the delivery is as it's stated currently. So, um, 
but it would be it would be um it would be early in 24. yeah well going back to that issue of the ets right if that is a schedule we would really be rolling out then personally i'd be comfortable not messing with the ets right now but on the other hand if we are going to be collecting data for six months or a year like laura suggests maybe should be done that means keeping the current ets rate for another two years that seems too long before making a change yeah and and also realize if we keep the the suggested uh, ets rate for two years customers are going to go through a rate shock when time of use comes into effect and they're paying off peak prices and they see a seven cent jump per kilowatt. So the 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 opportunity that we have right now with the PCA in place is that this season's heating bills will be the same throughout the season versus making a change in 2024 that shows the ETS abruptly uh, does not receive uh, their discount that they've been receiving for the last decade. And knowing that we're not recovering our cost of service. Yeah, and, and that's, that's we're, we're under collecting um, on this category of people. And, and we've been doing it for a long time. In 2014, the argument was some people had just bought into it. They bought into it because of the rate and we didn't want to you know have them in a hole on a on a system they just had spent a lot of money on uh that was eight years ago and we closed the program so that that would not happen again um, so the customers are now having systems that are over eight years old as a minimum uh so they they've received a lot of that benefit from that that subsidized rate just to be clear and factual brian we have not closed the program Anyone who's that that tariff is open. Anyone who wants to sign up for it can sign up for it. No, no, that, that we close that program was not supposed to continue after 2014. I can go back and show you the minutes. So, Brian, I think what you what you're talking about is we discontinued the rebate program. The rate is still there. So, if someone decided they wanted to put an ETS, they could sign up and get on that rate. But we're not promoting it. We stopped the promotion of it. Has has Any, anyone signed up since 2014? No. Okay. All right. So there is so it still stands that there are no new customers in the last eight years. Correct. Okay. Uh, Pam. What is one? What is the actual uh, just on a, your average user? What's the impact of of Brian's approach uh, in terms of just payment in in your bill? Is it is yes, it users are. ETS users, there's about, uh, if I remember correctly, 140 of them, and they they consume a lot of, of kilowatt hours in a month during the winter, like megawatts. So the 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 uptick in their in their bill would be if roughly. Brian, can you give that estimate? Um, well, what, I, Laura, uh, what percentage of their what will be the percentage increase? I guess so. I mean, these folks could use four thousand kilowatt hours a month um, easily, and I I don't have access to your comments, Brian. What was the increase that you were proposing for the rate class? How many cents per kWh? Uh, it was the the distribution cost. Here, let me see. So six cents. Yes. Or five cents. So, so going from uh, 00175 cent to 6033 uh, cent. Okay, so that's about 5.8 cents. So that would be like $230 a month. And if you figure that for five winter months, that would be you know over $1,000 for a customer. So it was, it was five what? I just did 5.8. I didn't actually do the subtraction. I just rounded it. Right, but the the PCA is five point nine, so their bill from December twenty twenty two to the you know my proposed full distribution collection in in January is going to be identical. No, it's not because if you see the ETS, um, that yes, they're not going to pay the uh, 
5.9 tenths, but they're going to be paying more than before the PCA. And then you're going to add another 5.8 on top of it. Because so the, what's the percentage increase for your average user of this category? Um, hang on a sec. Um, you're basically going to be uh, almost doubling. I don't, I see, I'm unfortunately on my computer in front of me, but what was the ETS actual rate? Is it, uh, so it's. If you open up the, the spreadsheet in my email, it, it has the comparisons for 21, 22, and 23. So the. Can the, I just, can I, oh, excuse me, Brian, sorry. So the cost of energy, so the, all rates are going up for 2023. If you, if, you, if you look at the increase in the cost that I propose for distribution, which is the six cents, which is what everyone else is paying for ETS, that 5.8 cents is equivalent to the PCA. So they will see an increase, you're right, you, they will see an increase in January, but that increase will be the increases that all rates are seeing. Yes. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, so to answer your question about percentages, Pamela, it's um, they're they're currently paying, well, not currently paying, the the base rate was about eight cents, okay? And Brian wants to add six more cents. So it's not quite a doubling. I see. Okay, I just, I wanna just um, add here, um, the, I, I'm sort of attracted to what Warren is saying, you know, how much are we gonna suffer? Maybe what perhaps is, a, is an unfairness. Um, and if it's only for a year or so, just to get the data straight and get our, our understanding straight, that may not be so terrible. The other uh, observation I would make is that I'm a little concerned that it seems like Laura hasn't seen your material, Brian, and there's a lot, it's like, it's, it's, there's a lot to digest here in 24 hours. And I, I have a general, just a last comment. I have a general predisposition to deference to the uh, light plant expertise in situations like this. Um, if we aren't comfortable with with everything that we're discussing and it doesn't have dramatically terrible impacts. So I guess I'm, I am- um, It does. It, well, okay. So Dave, do you mind if I can share my screen? No, <laughs> let me stop. Right. Go ahead, Brian. I'm going to... All right. Can people see this on the screen? Yeah. You need to make it bigger. Uh, Sorry, Brian, can you maximize your window? Uh, my 2013 computer is struggling with that, but all right. Can you, you see this table here? Yep. Okay. So today ETS is paying 14 cents a kilowatt hour that includes the PCA. If we accept the rates as proposed based on Baker Tilly, they're going to drop to paying nine cents. The off peak in 2023 as proposed is 16 cents. The difference is seven cents. I am proposing that we increase this distribution fee from less than a penny to the same price that is being paid for distribution for other rates, which would put them at 15 cents. So the difference is they would see an increase from 14 to 15 when they go to January. If we don't do this and we take off the PCA, when we do time of use, they're gonna experience something similar to a you know, nine or 10 cent to a, a, a 15 to 17 cent increase. 
when we do time of use. So That's if you decided to eliminate the ETS rate at that point, which we have not discussed, as Wendy said, we missed that, you know, that discussion. Right. But um, this is this is this this is the subsidy that they're yeah. receiving. But Brian, the sub, that's not fair, I don't think, to say that because, yeah, the a subsidy, according to the way you're looking at it, is seven cents. But as I said, it's probably not reasonable to charge them 8.98 cents for energy. They don't use it in the same pattern that the other rate classes do. Um, and furthermore, um, do, do we have a special contract to get discounted energy in the night? Well, you know, Brian, that energy costs less during the night than it does during the day generation not looking at transmission capacity correct generation but we're contracted for prices no we that's 20 percent in the spot market we, we always are buying and selling in the spot market right so so this so the the value that we get out of the spot market at night for the 20 percent, you want to give all of that to ets and not all ratepayers well i'm just saying that you know the, the subsidy is not as simple as as you've laid out, I, in my opinion. Um, and there's, there was another matter I wanted to point out to you on this, and it's escaping me at the moment. But, um, oh, the fact that you're calling this a subsidy, it seems egregious. But the residential rate class is getting subsidized to the tune of $2 million, Brian. So but that's, that's the whole rate class. That's This is 140 customers. It's, it's a whole rate class. This is its whole rate class. Yeah, I'm I'm frustrated. I, I apologize to everyone because I am very frustrated with our inability to take action on correcting these rates, and that is that's that's why I'm I'm that's that's the tone that I'm projecting, and I apologize for that. So I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to take a minute to cool down because I just I. I get uh, my personality. I get very frustrated with ineffective, in, inefficient uh, systems, and the way the board is approaching rates is is very inefficient in the sense that we have two cost of service studies that have told us that this is the ETS rate is not paying its way, and we're still wanting more analysis. Uh, the residential rate class is not paying its way either. How can you just choose one rate class to no, subsidize I, while the other ones are getting subsidies? So I, dis, I, I, I disagree with how you're painting me with that because I think that residents should pay the same that the G1 pays and the same that you know we, we do with the other rate classes. We can correct both. We don't, it's not a one or the other. That would so, be a huge change, Brian, a huge well, change. We'll, we'll we'll get into that discussion when we talk about time of use and how are we calculating our time of use rate. So I want to I, I I need I need to take I need to calm down. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Wendy to ask her question, um, and then and we'll check back uh, in with you. You know, and I'm not going to add to this. I just two comments. One is I I told uh, the chair and the rest of the board I have to leave at 9:05, so I'm going to have to drop shortly. Um, I just want to comment that I, because um, I won't be here for the remainder of the discussion, that I, I'm sort of hesitant to make a change on the ETS rate, Nate, ETS rate, um, because it requires more discussion. Um, it's the type of rate discussion that I was hoping that we would have had throughout the year, and we need to commit ourselves as a board to do that. So I just don't want to rush to do anything, but um, just a comment on that. And I apologize that I have to leave, but I don't have a choice here. So thank you. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to ask the board that we're going to do bi-monthly meetings for the next year to get through the backlog of these discussions and to stay on topics to conclusion. Because we're not we're not concluding the same discussions that we keep having and then we forget previous analysis and we go over it again. Um, I, I'm, we didn't finish this one, though, Brian, we need to schedule it so. Okay. Make and, a commitment and put a plan together and follow it. Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, you got to have a. You have to set priorities here and have a real schedule for the priority discussions that this board has got to have. And I think it's kind of like what we have. Asked, well, let's have. have I have made priorities. Let's, I have pushed question. them, but we keep saying that we can't meet. And when we meet once a month, we keep 
taking the same conversations again and again. Sorry, I didn't take my time to calm down. Um, no, I just, no, I just want to make a, I, this is really, an, I think is an important procedural point that we need a actual roadmap that's in writing of the meetings and what the priority issues are that we're going to cover and have it stated up front. And I, I maybe that such a document, it's a document exists. I don't think yep. it does. And I think we need to have that. If we have it, I want to see it. I will update it and send it out. And we need to talk about whether we agree on the priorities and the numbers of meetings. Um, yep. it, it's, it's yep. great, great if you did that for us. Thank, thanks, Brian. And I, I appreciate your passion. It's, it's yeah. great. <laughs> All right, I'm taking a deep breath. Um, the, 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 I know, Wendy, you need to, you need to go. Um, you've seen my email. Uh, there was one other change that I had suggested in the email, uh, which was the on-peak rate for time of use. I saw a 8% increase, not a 16% increase, which was in line with other rates. And I did not understand why and felt that it should increase by the same amount. Uh, Laura, can you give a quick explanation before Wendy has, oh, Wendy's already passed time. Um, Wendy, why don't you give us your thoughts before you go? I, I can't give my thoughts on that topic, Brian. I want to hear from Laura. Okay. Brian, uh, Brian, can I just say one? Uh, also, and I really, I do really value your commitment. I absolutely do. I think giving us this material too last night, I think, is, and where Laura hasn't read it, makes it very difficult to digest. Well, um, so I, I received the the packet, you know, rather recently, and we we can talk about process all we want, but let's let's get get Wendy through and get her on to our next meeting. Laura, can you tell me why the increase in the on peak rate uh, was not equivalent to other rates? Uh, Brian, I need to look at that. I I can't tell you off the top of my head. All right, and I, I I if I probably could in a normal day when I had my computer, but I'm dead in the water. Okay, I then we'll skip that for now. Wendy, what are your thoughts on the, the, the two proposed changes that I had? One, the 10% uh, increase in the fixed collection of distribution fees and two ETS. I, I think I know ETS, you wanna defer. Uh, you're muted. Sorry, um, I'm, yeah, I wanna pause on the ETS changes at this time and proceed with what's been proposed and then I am in support of increasing the fixed charge, but respect that that means Laura has work to do to revise those uh, variable rates down, right? Because an increase in the fixed rate is supposed to be budget but, you know, revenue neutral. Let me just comment on that. So yes. uh, I apologize and, and, to all of you. I'm sorry I have to leave. I don't have a choice, but thank you. All right, thank you, Wendy. Uh, um yeah and laura you had stated that you have the ability to make that change before our next meeting when we vote yeah it's not going to be easy but yes we we can do it okay well um i would like to propose uh, i would like to request a motion to close the rate hearing from either pam or um, warren ryan why don't you um take uh public feedback before we close the rate hearing Oh, I thought we had to close the hearing and then take feedback. No, you can do it in the hearing and then. All right. So, uh, Mark. Yeah, this is a hearing. And so it's, it is important. I noticed that another member of the public I, who I think had to leave also didn't get recognized. So when you are having a rate hearing, that's an, that's an important element. Um, I that think it's necessary to say out loud because I didn't actually hear it vocalized that the 2023 rates that you were showing represent a removal of the PCA and a replacement with the rates because, you know, for somebody who's not inside baseball, like all of us that happen to be on the, on the call right now, I think it's really important to say that, that that's what, that's what's going on um, in those rates. Um, I, I would also, you know, without furthering the ETS discussion, 
encourage that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. I think directionally, I'm hearing all of you on the board saying that you'd like to do something about that. And, you know, maybe going all the way to six cents is, is, is too far too fast um, and doesn't recognize the fact that everybody would like a little re relief from what happened in 2022 on the rates. But, you know, having that three cents or two cents or something like that could represent something that might help bridge that gap because I do think that there is a cliff coming um, when these all get right, rationalized because you're going to find yourself in two positions either in the future when the new cost of service study and the time of use information is all available and then you've got this big gap to close and then you end up with the same discussion that's happened both on the R1 rate and on this rate that says that's too much. So now we have to take a half measure and then that half measure doesn't, you know, makes it difficult to rationalize in the future. So um, directionally, I think there, there's something to be said for, for doing that in, in, and getting to that alignment. So I'll leave it there. Um, I guess the one final comment I'll make, which isn't quite on rates is I do encourage you to fix the schedule. If you're going to meet, you know, twice a month, meet twice a month, and then you'll get through some of these topics. It's very important, especially with all the changes, and it's simply not going to get less complicated from here. Thank you very much for your efforts. I really appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Um, is there any other, uh, anyone else would like to make a comment on rates before we close the hearing? And, and Mark, I would not have, have have not allowed you to speak. Uh, uh, I, I apologize for the process. Uh, you know, I'm, I, as Pam has noted many times, I'm not perfect on that. Understood. You know, it's just, a, it is important to, you know, for the hearing to, to do the hearing part of it. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, any other uh, feedback? Uh, uh, Warren, could I, could I ask that you put a motion out to close the rate hearing? Yes, I move that we close the right hearing. And return to regular session. And return to regular session, yes. I sure. second. Great. Um, uh, yes, and Warren? Yes. Uh, Pam? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, now we're on to public and liaison comments on any other topics discussed. Do we so, have any? Brian, before we go to that, can we just yeah. get a little direction? on you know, what we're going to be getting ready for a vote for the next meeting in terms of the rates. Are we looking to make changes to what we already proposed? And if so, um, that, that would be helpful because I don't wanna go into the next meeting and have the same discussion again. Whereas if we need to modify some of the tariffs, we have seven working days, uh, five working days yeah. rather to get it done. So that would be helpful for us. Well, uh, my summary of where I feel the board is, is that um, an increase in the meter charge that is uh, along the lines of the 10% or the 1850 for the R1 and apply that 10% to the rest of the rates uh, and then adjust the variable distribution collection accordingly. Uh, I think that was a clear request for a change uh, so Brian, just to clarify that, you want all the meter fees to be 10% higher than the current tariffs? Yes. Okay. In including the including the uh, commercial? Um, if I remember correctly, commercial uh, G2 and G3 were a 3% increase. Um, maybe that would be a 6% increase instead of a full 10. Because I, I assume there's some underlying reason why that increase was not 5%. If you could give me some exact numbers, that would help. Okay. Uh, uh, so, you have my, you don't have my sheet. Uh, so, the meter fee for R1, the time of use, and G1 would be $18.50. 1850, okay. That's a change from the 5% increase to a 10. Yep. Um, I don't have exact numbers for the G2 and G3, uh, but it would go from a 3% increase to a 6% increase. 6% increase. Yeah. Okay. So Brian, aligning with your spreadsheet that you sent last night. 
Yes. Okay. And, um, and, and that actually, you sent me that spreadsheet in 2022, and I just added the 2023 um, to that, Dave. Uh, and then the, the distribution per collection per kilowatt hour would decrease in accordance with those increases in, in fixed collection. Yeah, so it's revenue neutral. Yeah. Okay. Um, we really didn't get to discuss changing the the, the time of use on peak. Um, I, I really, I know Laura doesn't have it in front of her, um, but if you could come to us at the next meeting with um, an explanation of why the increase was not equivalent uh, to other rates for the on-peak charge. Uh, that would be helpful. Um, I, I would like to see the on-peak increase, um, you know, 16% like the off-peak did to keep the percentage spread uh, the same. I think right now it was the same 10 cent spread. I think a percentage is more appropriate. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, on ETS, we're going to need further discussion, um, but I, I, I agree with Mark's comment that the board desires uh, more collection of distribution than was proposed, uh, but I don't have a clear path forward for you on that one. Okay. Well, I think you've given us plenty of direction so we can get the tariffs together and ready for the next meeting. So yeah, that's helpful. I've before we move on, I want to ask Warren what his question yeah, is. Yeah, I just wanted to caution, let folks know I'm not going to be at the meeting next week. I'm going to be in California and not able to attend. Um, and I do want to say if I was there, I would abstain from the question of raising the fixed charge because I don't have enough information to understand the impact of that on customers. And if I was there listening to the discussion on the ETS, um, I'm not sure Brian has the right number for that increase, but it does seem to me like a modest increase, at least something smaller than the six cent increase would be justified to start moving that rate class in the right direction but to do something that is clearly unobjectionable. So maybe three cents or something, I don't know. Yeah, um, anything below a five cent increases, they're gonna see decreases in their bills in, when we change these rates. So. Um, and, and I would say so, something that sees a decrease in their bills, but is an increase in the rate. Yeah, yeah. Any other comments? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Warren, do you have any other comments? No. Okay. Uh, any other public liaison comments? Um, I see that, uh, ah, great. Uh, go ahead, Mary. Um, thanks, Brian. First of all, I just want, I'm Mary Hartman, a member of the select board. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you all for this meeting. It's been, it's great to see such an engaged and knowledgeable board. I, I love your conversations. I'm here to give the board a heads up that, um, the select board discussed progress against Article 38, which was the article that was asking for um, a schedule and a plan to generate solar on town owned land and to give that plan and a schedule to both the select board and the finance committee by December of this year. So we discussed that um, a few meetings ago and we're, um, we're hoping to invite you in and Dave, I'm, we're going to invite you in and any other board member that wants to come in to talk to the select board about progress against um, that citizen um, petitions article that passed overwhelmingly. So that's, I think, will be sometime after um, the special town meeting, which is January 19th. So I was trying to extract something when I was going through your budget, and I see we've got solar on the middle school. I also see we have something on BD Center, but I think we're looking for something a little bit more um, concrete as far as um, uh, schedule and um, and where that where where those solar uh, might be uh, put on town only. So that's a heads up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other public liaison comments? Uh, I would like to request uh, Pam. Do you mind making a motion to adjourn? <clears throat> I move that we adjourn. Uh 
the um, this meeting. Uh, do I have a second from Warren? Second. Great. Uh, I agree. Uh, Pam? Yes. Uh, Warren? Yes. Great. Thank you all. And I apologize for my tone. I'm just getting a bit frustrated. <laughs> I, hope I, I hope no one takes it personally. Uh, don't worry about it. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.